Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Jax and what's up? It's been a while. So sorry for the lack of voiceover videos and tutorials and for being a little slack with replying to comments. The last month or so has been, well, not more busy than usual, but I guess I've just been a little more disorganized. But today I thought it would be good to go over a few tips for painting backgrounds and environments in your artworks. This has always been something that I've got a lot of questions about, but it hasn't been something that I've ever felt knowledgeable enough to make an in-depth tutorial for. I mean, painting landscapes and environments is a whole genre of art in itself. And sometimes when I get these questions like, how do you do backgrounds? It's like, well, the answer's so broad, I don't know if I could ever put it to you in a concise step-by-step -step process. And also, backgrounds are something that I still want to try and improve on. Recently, it's been my main art goal to be able to make them feel super immersive and organic, and I'm still very much in the process of learning how to do that. But over the last few weeks, I have picked up a few useful tips, which I actually went through in a reply to a Tumblr ask. But since not everyone follows me there, I thought it would be nice to share it with you people on the YouTubes. And hopefully this will help those of you who are currently a bit intimidated by backgrounds and make them a little easier for you to tackle. Oh, also the speed paint being shown here was uh, last week's commission piece. It was a full body illustration commission with a very big background idea, hence kind of driving the idea for this week's video. All the tips I mentioned, uh, I do use throughout the process of painting this one. And while me saying the tips may not line up exactly in time with what I'm drawing, you should be able to scrub the video back and forth to see it in action at some point. I used Procreate on the iPad at the beginning to do the thumbnails and the final sketches, Medibang to do most of the painting, and then just a bit of Photoshop at the end to correct the colours and add a bit of brightness. Okay, so tip number one. You want to start with creating really strong forms, shapes, and values. And you're thinking, oh my god, there she goes again with the values, but really, really, they're important. Because they set up the foundation of your composition, and we all know a good foundation is a strong foundation. For landscapes, getting the right shapes and strong outlines is really key. Before you even start thinking about putting in details and mulling over, oh, which brush should I use for this or this texture, having clear outlines of the main natural objects and formations that are going to make up the bulk of your canvas space is essential. The goal you're trying to achieve here with these forms is to have just enough information in those laid down so that when you zoom out of your image by like 25%, all the important information should already be there. An image should basically look complete. For example, if you want to include a mountain, before you start worrying about how you're going to render the textures and the ridges within the mountain, think about how the outer outline or shape of the mountain is going to look first. Where's the peak going to be? How much of the sky is it going to take up? How is it going to be interacting with the lighting? Is it going to be contrasting really strongly with the color of the sky? Or do you want it to be a more subtle, distant feature and kind of fade into the sky a little more? It's really important to get all this broad information laid down, and it might not look like much when you view the image at 100%, but you'll know you've achieved a good composition if you view like a thumbnail sized version of the image and think, yeah, that's pretty much what I want the finished version of the image to look like. Once you have this handled and you're satisfied with your general forms, then you can start worrying about all the little textures and details. These essentially exist so that when people look at your artwork, they can get that sense of realism and richness in the environment you've made. I find it helpful to keep the textures of the forms at a relatively low contrast, unless part of the texture is a focal point of your composition. And for regular things like grass or the surface of a rock, you want to be able to see the texture enough to make out some of the shapes that exist within a larger formation, but not enough for it to distract from whether the focal point of your image is supposed to be. The contrast of values in textures within a formation should be less than, say, the contrast between the whole formation and the background it's set against. Having richness and variety in your textures is also really nice. These things you can practice independently, such as having little painting studies of specific things like mossy rocks or tree roots, and once you get the hang of them, you can easily just plop them in to your environment wherever you want. Okay, so moving on to tip number two. Remember that your environment and the objects in your environment exist in a 3D space. Yes, this seems very obvious, but often the problem is that we don't include quite enough cues to make this step explicitly perceivable in our artworks. Really try to lay your environments with the background, mid-ground, and foreground structure in mind. It's a simple and really basic tip, but just having objects that clearly exist in each of those spaces really adds richness and a sense of immersion. But it's sometimes not enough to just have this layer structure. Like I said, many of you probably already tried to do this and still get environments that look a little bit flat. 
And this is where some additional cues to death will come in handy, in order to help you make these layers look convincingly like they're existing in 3D space. For example, natural objects tend to become a lot less detailed, and fine textures become pretty much imperceivable when they're off in the far background. I remember it was tempting to draw every single individual leaf on a tree when I first learned how to draw leaves, or use tiny leaf brushes to give you know, trees in the background thousands of distinct little individual leaves. There's this fallacy some artists go through, thinking that the more detail they add to their artworks, the better it must be. But it's actually more of a curved linear function, and comes at a cost when you start putting in too much detail, especially to something that doesn't need to have it. You really shouldn't be able to see the edges and veins of each individual leaf in distant trees. Reduce the amount of detail and contrast in your textures the further towards the background the object is. You can do this by using broader strokes to paint in the rough shapes of the forms instead of the details, or even adding blur to blend over the fine details that you might have already added. These techniques essentially eliminate high frequencies in your background, which only serve to add unnecessary complexity to your artworks, and really distracts from whatever your focal point is supposed to be. Implementing some degree of aerial perspective is also a really good cue to death. If you have a mountain and a sky in your background, make sure the more distant mountains kind of fade into the colour of the sky, more so than closer ones. This pretty much applies to everything. Things further off in the distance tend to become more faded. Other things like using fog or light to create nice lines of plane separation between the different layers of the background is also a pretty simple trick you can use. And finally, one last perspective trick, again pretty obvious, things get smaller the further away they are. But in nature, it can actually often be difficult to get a sense of the scale without proper reference points. Natural scenes are often scale invariant, meaning you can paint one and the viewer wouldn't really know whether the tree is say 2 meters tall or building sized. I also find having things like animals or birds really help to convey the scale. Having objects in your environment that generally one knows the size of will give viewers a clear cue to the scale, rather than having them make assumptions. And also having these objects kind of get smaller towards the background, kind of fading towards the vanishing point, helps position a viewer to be able to gauge exactly how far the landscape is stretching. Personally, understanding perspective is still something I'm working on. All these tips I've suggested kind of are like shortcuts to implying depth, but shouldn't replace having a good understanding of vanishing points and the actual physics of perspective in the first place. But again, something I'm still trying to wrap my head around and hopefully I can bring a tutorial to you guys once I do figure it out. Okay, so tip number three and our final one. Choose your colors wisely. I think we've all had that problem at some stage where we're coloring a background and we choose the brown for the tree and the green for the leaves and then we take a step back and look at what we created and it's like, this looks so wrong. Don't trust your brain when you're picking colors. Trust what you see and not what your brain makes you think you see. Just like how our skin isn't purely skin colored, a tree isn't necessarily brown. Rather, it's a spectrum of the colors from the environment around it that it's absorbing and reflecting back into our eye. If you are having a lot of trouble creating harmonious palettes, I really recommend starting with references, either from photographs or from those color palette websites that give you little squares with tons of nice uh, color combinations. Personally, doing this really helped me notice how colors are never as saturated as my brain makes them out to be. This isn't to say that things in nature can't be super vibrant and saturated, but these tones are far more effective and visually pleasant when you have a base of muted tones to contrast them with. I've also recently found that starting out my pieces with relatively neutral undertones like greys or blues and then slowly building upon lighter layers of um, light and vibrant colour has really helped make my pieces look more three-dimensional. Think of things with bright contrast and vibrance or glow as points you can place within your environments to direct a viewer's eye, but never to take up the entirety of the image or overwhelm the viewer. All right, so those are my three tips for how to get started with backgrounds and environments. And I'm not giving these tips to you thinking like, oh yeah, I've already nailed all of them completely because I most definitely have not. But I think these are really good points to keep in mind for anyone starting to paint backgrounds or trying to improve their environments like I am. Let me know what you think and if you have any other tips you would like to share about drawing environments and landscapes, feel free to comment down below. I'd love to see them and I'm sure they'll help other people out as well. Anyway, I hope this video was helpful. Make sure you check out my Redbubble store. I've been slowly adding more things in there. Keep on drawing and I'll catch you all next time. Bye!